Now, this is a next generation sequencer, which, which is uh, several orders of magnitude higher throughput than, than what you, you were just looked at, you were just looking at. And this is what the Broad looks like right now. They've got a bank of these sequencers lined up. And uh, what you can see here is uh, individual uh, little spots of light that each one of which represents a sequencing reaction and is monitored uh, over time. And this uh, allows you to read out uh, the DNA sequences at a very much higher rate. And um, <coughs> now, uh, just last year, uh, Pacific Biosystems released a third generation sequencer. The sequencers I just showed you, one of the uh, great things about them is they produce a gigantic amount of information in a short period of time. The downside is they produce only about 100 to 200 of these uh, sequences of bases at a time. And because the human genome, for example, is full of repeated sequences, this pre presents a great challenge in terms of putting the sequences together in the right order. Because if you're in the middle of a repetitive sequence of DNA, uh, you don't know whether to hook that up with this repeat, that repeat, or that repeat over there. So it creates a problem in assembling the short sequences together into one much longer sequence. So this is uh, an $800,000 toy, uh, and it, it is able to read thousands of bases at a time. That's, that's what this uh, instrument does that the, the other ones cannot. And, and so in combination, this long read sequencer and the short read sequencers uh, are really going to define, uh, I think, the next phase of DNA sequence acquisition. These are very this is a very interesting machine scientifically because uh, it uses that's one of those bases there coming into uh, a DNA polymerase, and it's it's tagged with a fluorescent <coughs> molecule, and this is a single molecule of DNA polymerase uh, that's being imaged in a tiny tiny hole that only accommodates one of these polymerase molecules. I know you want to see that again. <laughs> um, so there's a flash of light just before the, the polymerase chomps down and, and cleaves off uh, the part of the nucleotide that's not required once uh, the, the nucleotide is incorporated into the growing chain. And so what you see actually is that in each of these tiny little uh, wells uh, in, a, in a disk about the size of a dime, uh, you have one DNA polymerase, and each one is flashing. And from the sequence of different colored light flashes that you see, uh, you can determine uh, the, the sequence of the DNA that that particular polymerase molecule is attached to. So anyway, this is the new uh, generation of technology uh, that we're, we're into now. And now I'm just going to say a few words about uh, uh, an area of the human genome that we're particularly interested in in, in our laboratory. And uh, that is um, actually something that surprised a lot of people when the first human genome came out. And that is that, as I mentioned, our, our genome is extremely repetitive. And about one, one third of our DNA is made up of uh, mobile DNAs that have the ability to move from one place in the genome to another place in the genome, so called uh, jump, sometimes called jumping genes. Um, in the case of the human genome, these are uh, called retrotransposons because uh, they move uh, via RNA. And they continue to do this today. In fact, um, I've done some calculations that suggest that in the last minute I was speaking, there were in each male in the room about 5,000 of these events happening in their testes. Um, so these things are actually affecting our genome as we speak. And uh, uh, there's a lot, there's enormous diversity in human populations in these uh, retrotransposons and where they're located. And obviously, if they jump into a gene, uh, they could have an impact. So let me just tell you a little bit more about how these things move. So here, here we have uh, a retrotransposons uh, as this blue arrow here. So this is uh, a, a 6,000 base long piece of DNA. And it becomes transcribed into RNA, like any other gene. 
So like a messenger RNA, and that messenger RNA does what any messenger RNA would do and goes out to the, from the nucleus of the cell to the cytoplasm of the cell. And then it gets translated like any uh, other messenger RNA. It specifies the code for uh, two proteins, actually, a, called the yellow protein and the blue protein. And then the, the RNA molecule and the protein molecules that it encoded come together into a kind of uh, machine or particle called an RNP. And then uh, this, this blue molecule here is, is actually uh, an enzyme. It is a DNA polymerase, once again. But it, instead of copying DNA, it copies RNA. And that's called reverse transcriptase. You're probably familiar with retroviruses like HIV, uh, which encode a reverse transcriptase. In, in, in many ways, this is a very similar process. And <clears throat> this RNP then goes back into the nucleus. And <clears throat> inside the nucleus, that RNA is copied uh, and, and, and inserted into a new site in the genome. So this is the process uh, that we study in my lab. And as I said, uh, we have uh, uh, about one third of our genome is made up of this kind of material. Most of it is, is not active, but it's sort of ancient fossils of events that happened uh, a long time ago. But there are uh, hundreds of copies of these things uh, that are active uh, in our genome today. Now, uh, <clears throat> transposable elements are not found only in human. Uh, this, this is a tree of life showing uh, everything from bacteria at the bottom to a wide variety uh, of different multicellular organisms. And what I hope you can see is that each pie chart rep represents the genomes of these organisms. And the orange part is the non-transposon part. So what we would think of as normal genes. Uh, so, the, so the bacteria at the bottom have, have, they actually have a tiny slice of this transposon DNA. You can, probably can't see it. But uh, mostly non-transposon genes. Uh, but as you get into the multicellular organisms, you see uh, an, an enormous diversity in the amount of uh, DNA that's made up of these mobile elements that, that, that can really uh, take over a genome. The extreme case here is uh, maize, which is, uh, has a lot more of the mobile DNA than of the regular DNA. So this is going on all through the tree of life. And so one of the, the main things that we seek to answer with our research is uh, we have all of this phenomenal uh, phenotypic diversity in humans. and uh, we would really like to know how much of that is due to the SNPs and copy number variations that Dave alluded to, uh, and how much of it might be due to this insertion uh, process where, where DNA just gets inserted uh, randomly into the human genome somewhere. So <coughs> we, think, we think that uh, the this may have a, a fairly large impact, but it, it, it turns out to be technically challenging to uh, uh, collect information on all of these transposons throughout the genome. We've developed methods now to do that. Um, what, we, what we do know from earlier work is that <clears throat> when one of these elements inserts into the genome, it only it, it, it has a very low chance of, of actually hitting the part of a gene that counts. 